My grandparents came from Shanghai in the 1930s to Singapore. My grandfather was a carpenter. Uh, together with his wife, they had eight children. My father was the oldest of eight uh, children. And when my father was um, 18 years of age, he contracted arthritis and after five painful operations was consigned to a pair of crutches. Uh, for the rest of his life, when my mother married my father, my mother married a crippled man, and uh, that simply mean, meant that she had to take care of him uh, for the rest of her life. And together with my dad, we, uh, they had three children. I'm the middle son. I've got two older, one younger brother, one older brother. We grew up in a home in the East Coast, and uh, the house is still there. It's a large house. It's all my childhood memories are tied with that home. My grandparents stayed with us, and they had uh, these um, household idols. And there was a room where my grandparents put all these idols. And I remember when I was a young boy, my grandmother would drag me into that room and make me bow down to those idols. And for some reason, I never wanted to be in that room. Uh, but then my mother got saved during the charismatic renewal. And when my mother got saved, her whole nature changed. She was like a new, different person. And I thought to myself as a young lad, I said, if, if Jesus can do this to somebody, to my mom, then I want to know this Jesus. I remember at the age of 16, I heard the gospel for the very first time. And uh, when the lady was talking to me about Jesus, my heart was on fire. And uh, she said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I said, yes, I do. She said, would you like to receive him into your heart? I said, yes, I would. And she said, pray after me. I said a simple prayer. I never prayed in my life. And I said a simple prayer after her. And at the moment Jesus Jesus came into my life, I knew something had changed because I remember when I walked out of that home, the sky was bluer, the grass was greener, and everything looked more beautiful. Um, but you know, I was 65% rascal. I was a, I was a naughty little uh, young man, and um, you know, and uh, and then I got saved, and um, and I struggled with the uh, with, with with areas of sin in my life, and um, my father passed away when he was 50, when he was very young. And I remember my, my life started spiraling downwards. I was in the army at that time. And, um, and I, was, I was in a life of sin. And there was this charismatic renewal that was going on in the denominational churches. And it was a Friday night when I was invited to a meeting. And I went to the meeting. I was sitting at the back row, back row. And the preacher got up to preach. And my goodness, I never heard a man preach like this man. He was preaching with such a conviction, with such a fire. And my heart was burning, literally burning. And uh, when he finished the meeting, closed the meeting, I said to my friend, I said, is he coming back tomorrow? She said, yes. So I said, I'm going to go to the service. And the next evening, on a Saturday evening, I was there in the church, seated in the fourth row. And this man gets up to preach again. And again, I never heard a man speak like this man. My heart was on fire. When he finished preaching, he said, everybody stand up. And I got up with everybody else. There was about, I guess, maybe a thousand people. I got up with everybody else. He said, everybody raise your hands. And I raised my hands. And uh, he said, we're going to worship the Lord with a song. And so we sang that great charismatic song. He is Lord. He is Lord. He's risen from the dead and he is Lord. And I remember with my hands raised and I'm, listen, I'm in a mess. All right? my, I had a blasphemous mouth. I was living in sin. I had all kinds of problems in my life. And as we raised our hands to worship the Lord, I never forgot this happened 40 over years ago. He said, the Holy Spirit is here. When he said that, it didn't take a rocket scientist to know that God walked into that room. The whole place became energized by the presence of God. It was as though someone turned on the switch into that room and the power of God filled that room. And I, when he said, the Holy Spirit is here, this lady, two seats beside me on my right, she collapsed to the ground. Somebody else collapsed. Somebody else collapsed. And I knew God was in that room. And when my hands raised and my eyes closed, I said, God, I'm in a mess. But if you can touch me, I will give my life to you. I'll serve you all the days of my life. And I don't know what happened in those few moments. It was like the finger of God came and touched my fingertips. And I could feel this tingling sensation, this fire running down my forearm. And suddenly, like a million volts of electricity, the power of God just rushed into me. Jesus said, you shall receive power. P-O-W-E-R, power, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And I felt this rush of the power of God. And the first thing that happened was my legs went soft like jelly. I couldn't stand. And I felt every cell in me was going to explode. And at some point in the, in the experience, I actually thought I was not going to make it. I thought I was going to die because every cell in me felt like it was going to explode. Uh, somebody asked me one time, Pastor, what did it feel like when the power of God came upon you? I said, go back home, unplug one of your appliances, put your finger in. <laughs> Jesus said, you shall receive power. I remember after 20 minutes, 30 minutes, the, when the, the presence lifted up, 
I, I, I floated out of the church. I didn't walk out. I was full of the joy of the Lord. I've never experienced something like this before. And uh, for the next six months, every morning I got up, there was this joy unspeakable. It was an amazing experience. And I started seeking God. Hallelujah. I was in the university. And I said to my mom, I remember in the second year of university, I said, Mom, I want to quit my studies. I want to serve Jesus. She said, why don't you finish your university? And if you, after that, if you want to serve the Lord... I have no objections. And the Lord says, listen to your mom. Hallelujah. Sometimes we should listen to our parents. Amen. I finished university. I had to wait six years. I was working in a bank in the, um, in the real estate department of a bank. And every year, I would say to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready to come to full-time ministry. If you call me now, I'll quit everything and come and serve you. And the Lord would, in his way, speak to me very clearly. He said, you're not ready. So I would wait another six months, one year. And I said, Lord, I'm ready for full-time ministry. And he said, no, you're not ready. And I wait again. And this year when one year passed, and another year passed, another year passed. And, um, and then they promoted me. And then they promoted me again. And things got very hunky-dory. And uh, God was blessing my life. I, I had a two-and-a-half story house and everything was great in my life and I at that time I had two kids oh pastor by the way I have four kids not uh, not two well you you <laughs> and uh, and uh, everything was going great in my life and then my bosses came to me one day they said hey young we've been watching you they said um uh, if you stay in this company, you've got a great future. And then the Holy Spirit said, now I want you to quit your job. <laughs> you know? And I rebuked that voice in Jesus' name. Six months, I struggled. I don't know how many months I struggled. But finally, I said to the Lord, for me, it was a matter of finances. I said to the Lord, if you can show me, you can provide for me. I'll quit my job. And the Lord spoke to me. He says, no, you quit your job. I'll show you. I can provide for you. It's called faith. It's spelled R-I-S-K. Amen. And every time you take a step of faith, it's a bungee step of faith. You've got to trust the Lord. So I took that step of faith and I resigned from my job. Didn't know where my provision was going to come from. Uh, a few days after I quit, I got a, a call from a senior vice president, Offshore Bank. He said, I heard you quit. I said, yep. He said, come and see me. I said, okay. So I'm at his office. We're looking over the Marina Bay area. Beautiful office. Plush carpets. Beautiful couches and I was sitting down with talking he says young I like what you're doing I said you do he said yep he says I want to help you I said you do he said yes and he gives me a piece of paper we call it a check hallelujah and I opened this twelve thousand dollars now this is way back in the 1990s and uh, twelve thousand and I looked at the check and I said a quick prayer to God I said Lord if this is full time I like it hallelujah <laughs> I'm going back by the MRT train. I'm singing all the way. You know, it's this new song in my heart. And the new song went something like this. Lord, you should have called me earlier. <laughs> I get a, I, true story, I get back into my office. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. Real estate developer on the line. He says, Young, I heard you quit. I said, yep. He says, come and see me. I said, I'll be right there. He says, no, we'll do lunch tomorrow. I said, okay. So I, I'm at his office in this long conference table. He's on one side. I'm on one side. We're talking. He says, Young, I like what you're doing. I said, you do? He said, yeah. And I never forgot that. He took out an envelope from his, his, his jacket and slides it across the table. I said, what is this? He said, take a look. And I opened this $9,000 inside. And I, when, he, when I saw that, the Lord said to me, if I call you, I will pay the bills. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, when I was working for DBS, the bank, uh, you know, every uh, end of the month, 27th of the month, I would take my ADM card and go to the machine and they would credit my salary. If I can trust the bank to do that and support me, how, how many of you know we can trust the Almighty God to, to supply all our needs? Amen. And this is my 32nd year pastor in full-time ministry. And I tell you, I don't regret one day of my life serving the Lord. I have not looked back one single day the life that God has chosen for me. Hallelujah. Amen. And I, 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 I rejoice and I want to thank, I thank the Lord. You know, I still get up 4.45 every morning to thank the Lord. And one of the things I thank God every day for is that He called me into ministry those 30 years, two years ago. And I'm serving Jesus. And I tell you this, I'm more on fire today than I am 32 years ago. Amen. And I want to encourage you. The best is yet to be. Amen. My text for today is 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 1. If you can flash that scripture out on the screen. And it says, after these things, David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Metek armor. He took Metek armor from the hands of the Philistines. Now David was a prodigy. He was a, he was a, he was a priest, he was a prophet, he was a king, he was a giant slayer, he was a songwriter, uh, he was a poet, uh, he was an amazing man of God. But above all that David was, he was a man after God's own heart. 
I don't know of a man in the Bible that had a passion for God like David did. He was all heart for God. But David was also a warrior. And as all warriors do, he shed very much blood. You know, David's life could be defined by the, by the battles that he fought. When David was young, remember he killed a lion and he killed a bear. Now a lion is an animal that loves to eat. A bear is an animal that loves to sleep. If you're ever going to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, you must overcome your love for eating and your love for sleeping. Hallelujah. Hard thing for Singaporeans to do. <laughs> and then David went on to, uh, you know, if you, David killed a lion and a bear while no one was watching that qualified him to kill a giant when everybody was watching. After David killed the lion and the bear, he went on to fight a giant, a nine and a half foot monstrosity called Goliath. And with one stone, Goliath had to Goliath down. Hallelujah. And he, went, and he killed Goliath um, in, in the midst of all the people. And, and you know, my friends, whenever there's a giant in front of you, it's because there's a David on the inside of you. Never be afraid. Never be intimidated by the size of your enemy. Amen. Every time the enemy, every time there's a Goliath is in front of you, it's because God wants to manifest the David on the inside of you. So David went on to fight the battles of the Lord and he fought the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Moabites and everywhere David went, God gave him the victory. The New Testament counterpart of David is the Apostle Paul. When Paul got saved, the moment he got saved, he went ballistic. He started preaching the gospel, and everywhere he went, expanded the boundaries of the kingdom of God. I think in the last 2,000 years, we have not had a, a member of the church as productive as the Apostle Paul. Woo! And he preached the gospel, and all of David's, all of Paul's life, he preached the gospel. He was an erudite Jewish rabbi that was trained in the protocols of both the Jewish culture, the Greek culture, and the Roman culture. And he knew how to bring the word of God, and that man was, uh, was an amazing apostle. And you know, at the end of his life, this is how he surmised his life. He said, I've kept the faith, I've, I've finished the course, but I fought the good fight. Hallelujah. Amen. And all, of, Dave, all of, Dave, of Paul's life, he fought the good fight. All of David's life, he fought the fight as well. Now, David had two great battles in his life. The first great battle is 2 Samuel chapter 5. You don't have to turn to it, but let me just give you the synopsis. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David is about 37 years of age. He's just been anointed king over the 12 tribes of Israel. When the Philistines heard that he became king, they came to the valley of Rephaim, which is the valley of giants, and Israel had never won a battle in that valley. And they had only one objective, kill David! Kill David! Because they never forgot the humiliation that David caused them 20 years ago when he killed the giant so publicly in front of everybody. It was a personal vendetta. So they came down to the valley of Rephaim and they had one objective, kill David. David goes to his stronghold and says, Lord, what should I do? Shall I pursue them? Will you give me victory? My friends, every time you are making a decision, you've got to ask two questions. Can I do it? And will you give me good success? Come on. Amen. You know, a lot of people say, Lord, can I marry this person? But they never ask the second question. Will it be a happy marriage? Can I take this job and will you make me successful in this job? Amen. Always ask the Lord two questions. The first question, can I and will you make it a successful? Amen. So David said, Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give me good success? And he said, go up for undoubtedly I will give you good success. Defeats the Philistines in a supernatural way. It's like he broke through like the breakthrough of water. And he had a revelation of who God was that day, the God of the breakthroughs. And I tell you this, I believe Pastor God wants to introduce himself to this congregation as the God of the breakthroughs. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and so David... Um, and uh, that was the first great battle that David fought. The second great battle that David fought is the scripture that I just read to you in 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 1. What's happening here is that David was fighting the militia, the Philistines. They came against David. They would, would go out and fight them and defeat them. They would retreat, lick their, their wounds, regather, come back again. They, David would fight them and they would retreat and it would go on and on and on. And David realized, I cannot win the battle if I'm always defending my turf. Because at some point in our lives, my friends, you cannot win the battle. If you're only defending, you've got to go on the offensive. And so David decided that he was going to go for broke. 
And he attacks the Philistines' capital city. It was called Metek Amar. And Metek Amar is called the bridal of the mother city. Boy, this was the operational HQ. This is the capital. This is where all the raiding parties came out. This is where the king and the queen was. And David goes for broke and he goes after the Metek Amar. And he takes this Philistine city. And I tell you this, after this battle, the Philistines were no longer an existential threat for Israel. After this battle. They were no longer a threat to Israel. Something happened when David took Metek Amar. Something broke in the spirit. Hallelujah. Shakaba. And then after that, David went on a rampage. He fought the Moabites. He fought the Ammonites. He fought the Syrians. And no one could stand against David. Something happened. Something happened when he took Metek Amar. There was a, there was the power of darkness over the entire geographical region was broken. Hallelujah. Shakaraba. There was another man in the Bible who alludes this to this principle, and it was Joshua. All of Joshua's battle in the wilderness were defensive. They were not out to pick a fight with anybody, Pastor. But the moment they crossed that Jordan River, all the battles were offensive. All the battles. And they had to fight the enemy. And the first city, of course, was Jericho. When the river parted and he saw Jericho, I can tell you he was not laughing. Because Jericho was the most fortified, most fiercely defended city in all of Canaan land. And he was looking at Jericho. And you know the story of Jericho. Now if I was God, I would open the river to some small little town that they could obliterate in five minutes. Hallelujah. You know, give them some confidence, you know. Then maybe a bigger town, a village, a bigger village, a, a bigger town, a bigger city. I'll leave Jericho to the last because Jericho was the strongest. It was, it, they were outmatched, outgunned, outmaneuvered in every way. But God doesn't do that. He makes us face off with the most powerful adversary because if you can take the strong man, if you can bind the strong man, you can take all the spoils. Hallelujah. You know, I'm preaching so much better than you're responding. Hallelujah. You're supposed to be a Pentecostal bunch, right? In 1995, uh, you know, and after, of course, David took, and after Joshua took Jericho, he went on a rampage and 31 kings later, Defeats every city in Canaan land. Amazing. Jericho was the gateway city. Jericho was the Maytek armor. Once you take Jericho, everything starts falling like flies. It starts falling like dominoes. In 1995, July, I was preaching. My church uh, had just started. We were at the World Trade Center Auditorium. Some of you remember that on the 11th floor. And I was preaching one morning. And this has only happened once or twice in my life. And the word of the Lord comes to me. While I was speaking, we were renting facility after facility after facility. And we were at the World Trade Center. And the Lord spoke to me so clearly, right in the middle while I was preaching. And he says, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a new building. I'm going to give you a new building. I stopped and I said, oh my goodness, God just spoke to me. I heard his voice. He said, he's going to give us a building. And people started weeping. It was a very unusual service. A few weeks later, I was reading a magazine. And the magazine, in the magazine was a story of a man called David Wilkerson. Now, some of you would have heard of David Wilkerson. Started Teen Challenge, wrote The Cross and the Switchblade. At that point in life, T David Wilkerson was, was planning to retire in Texas. And the Lord says, David, I want you to go to New York City. He said, I don't want to go to New York City. I want to retire in Texas. The Lord says, David, go to New York. I don't want to go to New York. I want to retire in Texas. The Lord says, David, if you go to New York City... I will give you a building that when you walk into the building, I will take your breath away. Now, those of you who've been to the Big Apple, to New York City, if you've ever been to Times Square, visit Times Square Church. And I promise you this, I promise you this, when you walk into the auditorium, it's going to take your breath away. It's the most beautiful auditorium in all of North America. It's the Mark Hellinger Theater, the flagship of Broadway. And when David Wilkerson went to New York City, God gave him the flagship of Broadway right in Times Square, right in the middle of the Big Apple. And I tell you, that was an amazing testimony. I was so inspired by the story. I read that story. I, I said, Lord, give me a building that when I walk in, you take my breath away. A few weeks later, an agent called me up. He says, Pastor, there's this nightclub for sale. Do you, do you want to come and see it? I said, okay. And I remember walking into the nightclub. It was called the Music World. 
the first thing I saw was a, a bronze sculpture of a demon crucified on the cross. Then I saw the gargoyles, all these demonic creatures on the left and on the right hand side of this huge hall. And in front were cages where the girls would dance almost without any clothes on. And as I was looking at this auditorium, I tell you what happened. God took my breath away. <laughs> He said, I want you to, this is the place I have for you. For 18 months, we prayed. Oh my goodness, we prayed and it was on and it was off and it was on and it was off. And you know these guys who run all these nightclubs, they're tough guys. I remember when I went to see the nightclub opera, he was a tenant. But I was wanting to buy him out and I said, sir, I want to buy you out. He said, you buy me out, I'll buy you out. Wow. You know, they were really fierce guys, man. So for 18 months, we prayed. And finally, the nightclub closed, and we bought the nightclub. And you know why the nightclub closed? They found ecstasy inside, hallelujah. And so the police came and shut them down. And I said, I, I told my church members, I didn't put them there. I didn't put it there. <laughs> God, I did something. They begged me to buy them out, literally. Begged me to buy them out. And so we bought the whole nightclub with the, the, the silver balls and the likes and the... Woo! What I did not know, ladies and gentlemen, was this nightclub was the biggest nightclub. Those of you who, I see some older people here. Some of you know the Sparks Disco, the Fire Disco. This was the third largest nightclub in Singapore at the time. And it was the Maytek Arma. You know, the Juchet Katong area is filled with nightclubs and pubs and massage parlors. So when we bought this nightclub, what I did not know was there was something that broke in the spiritual atmosphere in that whole area. Then guess what happened? We bought a second nightclub. Then we bought a third nightclub. Then we bought a pub. We bought a second pub. Bought another nightclub. Took a massage parlor. And then I realized that I had an anointing for nightclubs. Hallelujah. <laughs> I really have an anointing for nightclubs. So we started to pray. And you know the whole Katong area. You know the, the, the whole area. The Juche area. We started to pray. And I tell you this one nightclub after another nightclub closed. And in the last 26 years since we've been there. We've seen 50 nightclubs closed in that whole area. 50 nightclubs. The whole place today is snazzy. It's upmarket. You kind of come to Katong. It's like the promised land. Bro. <laughs> there was a nightclub below us. The name of the nightclub was Shalala. And when they turned on the sound system, boom, boom. It was so loud that the floor that we were in started shaking. Literally. The sound system was so powerful. And so one day a, a man came up to me and says, Pastor, I feel the presence of God. I said, how do you know that? He says, the floor is shaking. <laughs> I said, no, that's not God's presence. That's Shalala. So I said, Lord, we got to do something about this shalala. So we started, we had a video, we did a shalala becoming a hallelujah. That was our project. We started praying against the, the nightclub and Lord, we just pray that you will give us the nightclub. Six months we prayed. I had friends coming in and they were praying with me as well. Finally, one day, out of the blue, the nightclub owner calls the church. He says, I want to see your pastor. So I'm intimidated. You know, these guys are all tough guys. And so I go down to the nightclub. I don't know what to expect. You know, I'm, I'm very intimidated. This man comes walking. It was smelling of cigarettes and smoke and pictures of scantily dressed women all around. And this man comes up. He says, are you the pastor? I said, yes, sir, I am the pastor. True story. He goes down on his knees like that. He holds my hands. He says, you tell me, how do I become a Christian? <laughs> so I led him to Christ. And then I said, sir, now that you're a believer, you can't run a nightclub. He said, what should I do? I said, you should give it to the church. And so, <laughs> we took Shalala, hallelujah, amen. We took Shalala. You know, there was, a, there was a story, true story of a nightclub in America. This man wanted to build a nightclub in a very nice suburb in, in America. And it was right in front of a church. And the church council sent a note to the, to the town council and said, we object to this nightclub being placed right in front of the church. Well, the council overruled the church and says, we decided to let him, let him build the nightclub. So he was building the nightclub. And true story, just a few months before the nightclub was completed, there was an electrical storm and a lightning bolt struck the nightclub and burned it to the ground. And the church was praying all the way. All right? 
So the light. <laughs> So the nightclub owner pastor sued the church. Yeah. He said, this is the, the finger of God and you, you guys prayed against us. That's why the lightning. So the church denied all responsibility. <laughs> True case. The case went up to the judge. The judge said, I have a problem. I have a nightclub owner that believes the power of God and I have a church that doesn't believe the power of God. You know, I want to tell you one more story, and this is, not all my stories are success, but last year we, we looked at another nightclub, and it was far bigger than the one that we have. Huge, humongous nightclub in the, the Jalan Sultan area. You know, that place is a, a rowdy, seedy area, and I felt we should start moving into those areas. So I went to see the nightclub, and I had all my boxes, you know, MRT straight stations, three MRT stations. I take that. Near all the food, I think that 500 car park lots. I think that, oh, it's so good. It's perfect for us. It's got no pillars. It's a huge span, high, high ceiling. I said, my goodness, this is an ideal. We paid the deposit. Everything was done. I was so excited. And then the Holy Spirit said, you check every box. You didn't check my box. And I want to just say this to you. I'm not in this project. And I tell you, I almost died, Pastor. I almost died. I, I, I tried to wriggle my way out. I couldn't. And finally, I met my leaders and I said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I thought this is God's place for us. It was a massive nightclub. I thought this is God's place for us. And uh, obviously, you know, the Holy Spirit is, you know what he said to me? He says, like Moses, he says, if you go up, I will not go with you. And I said, Lord, if you don't want to go with us, then what's the point of going? I, I, so I went to the owner and I begged him literally. I said, let me rescind the deal. And he was very kind to do that. But he said, Pastor, you have to pay a compensation because I had to prepare the place, you know, didn't get the tenants in. And uh, so we had to pay him $250,000. So I said, I'll bite the bullet. I stood in front of the whole church. I apologized. I said, I thought I heard God. I didn't. And I bear the full responsibility as your senior pastor. And you know, Pastor, in all my 32 years of ministry, I never had the church support me more than I did that morning. They wrote to me hundreds of letters coming in. Pastor, we are 100% before. They, don't, they said, Pastor, we don't want a famous senior pastor. We want a pastor that is humble before God. Hallelujah. Yeah. They like to see pastors humble themselves. I don't know why. <laughs> Church members, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, it was the, the, one of the most powerful Sunday services I ever had. A few days later, a man comes to my office. I've not seen him for 20 years. Not a believer. He doesn't know my church. He doesn't know what's happening in the church at all. And um, we just had some association 20 years ago. And he comes to my church. He has an envelope. He says, give this to Pastor Young. And my staff kept it for two days. And finally, they told me there's an envelope. I said, take a look at what it's. And they opened the envelope. It's a check for $350,000. And you know, Pastor, the Holy Spirit said so clearly to me. He said, because you were obedient, I'll pay the bill for this one. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ. The principle I'm alluding to is called taking the head of Goliath. Goliath was nine and a half foot tall. When he stood before the children of Israel, they had never seen a monstrosity like him. I mean, he was all muscle. There was an um, um, armor bearer before him. Forty days. Is there a man that can fight with me? Saul was the only man that could fight with, with Goliath. He was the strongest man in Israel. But Saul was not willing to fight this man. Finally, a 16-year-old boy, red hair, freckles on his face, called David, comes up and says, I'll take the giant. Saul says, you, you're a lad. This man has been fighting since he was a lad. He says, no, nah, I'll kill a giant. I'll kill a bell. I'll take this guy. And so you know the story. He goes down to the brook five smooth stones. You know, I heard a preacher said this one time. He said, David had five stones because just in case he missed one, he still had four, and that's wisdom. That's baloney. David had five stones because Goliath had four brothers. And just in case those brothers wanted to intervene, David says, I'll kill all five men. So he goes down and, you know, with one stone, hits the giant on the head. And the, the Goliath had to go live down, cuts the head of the, he cuts the head of the giant with his sword. And once he did that, something happened. What happened? The fear of giants left Israel. All of a sudden they realized, oh my goodness, these giants can be killed. Of course they can be killed. What do you think? And after that was giant hunting season. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
All the rest of the giants were killed by David's men, not by David. Listen, if you want to be a giant killer, you got to hang around giant killers. You want to be an eagle, you can't hang around them turkeys, man. Hallelujah. You know? And so David, once he'd killed that giant, all of a sudden, uh, there was giant hunting season, and there was something that was broken over Israel. It was a field of giants. Hallelujah. A few years ago, the Lord called us to buy the Bible College of Wales. It's a famous, iconic college in Swansea. We visited the place in 2011. I saw the derelict. All the buildings were derelict. And oh, by the way, my major in university was real estate. You know, God doesn't waste anything in our lives. He trains us for the future because he knew that one day I would manage his estates. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember seeing the place the Lord said, I want you to buy the Bible college. I want you to redeem the Bible college for me. And I remember coming back to Singapore. And the, we were negotiating for six months. Couldn't come to some of the agreements. And uh, the deal was almost scuttle. And we were having our first kingdom invasion conference in those days. And Bill Johnson and Randy Clark were our speakers. Second day of the conference, the morning sessions, there were about four and a half thousand people. I just introduced Bill, and he was speaking, and I'm on the, uh, he was on the platform, and I'm on the uh, you know, front row. And, and he preached one of the greatest sermons I've ever heard on how one man can make a difference. He's talking about Jonathan and his armor bearer and how they went on to fight with the whole garrison of the Philistines. He ended the story by, uh, by telling the story of a man called Shama. And I'll end the story with this. This man, Shama, was one of three of David's mighty men. And he's mentioned in the Bible because he defended, in a battle with the Philistines, he defended a field of lentils. Everybody had retreated. He's the only guy in the field. Takes out his sword right in the middle. No more retreat. And that day, God gave him a, I mean, he became a one-man killing machine. Sounds like killed the Philistines. And when I think Israel saw the bravery of this one man, came back to the battle line. Now, I know that story. I've read this so many times. But what I did not know was what Bill was going to say. He said, that field of lentils, that field of lentils was where David killed Goliath. And when he said that, the spirit of the living God fell upon me and I started weeping. I burst out weeping. Right in the, there in the front row of the, of the Singapore Expo, I started breaking down. I wept and I wept and I started crying because the spirit of God came and then a mantle came down from heaven. I, you, a mantle is a piece of cloth. A mantle came down and wrapped itself around me. I could feel this cloth wrapping itself. And the Lord says, now you defend my field of lentils, the Bible College of Wales. When he spoke to me that I, I'm weeping, and when he said that to me, about 10 seconds after he said that to me, a man comes up from the crowd. He comes to the front. He puts his arms around me like this and says, Pastor Young, the Lord says to you, buy the Bible College of Wales. And then he walks away. <laughs> and I was so ruined. I, the next day I called the owner. I says, I don't care what it's going to cost us. We're buying the Bible College of Wales. And since then we bought chapels as well. And, and God has given us a very strong foothold uh, in the United Kingdom as well. And um, my wife and I, we travel there four times every year. And this is our, sort of a second base for us. I share all this because I believe that God wants to, to give you, move you out from a defensive posture into an offensive posture. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let's believe God for the second floor in this building. Amen. Let's pray them out. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, third floor. Okay. <laughs> sorry. This is, the, this is the second floor. And the fourth, all right, the third floor. Third floor. I'm so sorry. Let's, let's believe God for it. Amen. You know, sometimes it, all it takes is a little push, hallelujah, in the spirit, and you see what God can do. Amen. I want you to stand up because I feel like the Lord wants to enlarge your, your tent, hallelujah. He wants to enlarge your tent, stretch out the curtains of your habitation, hallelujah. You shall expand to the left and to the right, amen. Jesus, hallelujah. My friends, I tell you this, you know, I'm 62. By the end of the year, I will be 63. But there is no retirement, there's only refinement, hallelujah, amen. I, you know, they, they say the older you get, the, the, the richer you get. You've got silver in your hair, you've got gold in your teeth, you've got gas in your stomach, hallelujah, and you've got lead in your feet, amen. And you know, at my age, I tell you, it's a, you know, it's a, 
it's like diminishing returns. You know, it takes you longer to recover from your jet lag and you, your bone starts creaking and your muscle starts aching and your plumbing starts leaking and all kinds of things that you have to go through. But you know, I thank God for what Paul said in the book of Corinthians that while the outer man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed. Hallelujah. Shamaradanda, so come on, hallelujah. Lord, give us strength, hallelujah, for the next season. Lord, I pray for this uh, congregation. I pray for Pastor Lawrence and his team that you would put within them, Lord, a warring anointing, hallelujah. Shandarabahandai, a warring anointing, Lord. Shikarabahandai. Oh God, let the, the anointing that was upon the tribe of Judah be upon them, Lord. That anointing for war. Hallelujah. Shakaraba. Let them not shy away from a battle, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that as they rise up as an army, that Lord, you will give the mighty warriors in this house, Lord, who will rise up and be strong, Lord. And like David, Lord, and like Paul, Lord, take territory for you. Hallelujah. Shikarabahandai. Sundaraba, Shikaraba. Hallelujah. In 1915, in the, in the class of the U.S. Academy, Military Academy, there were 164 cadets. Out of that, 59 became generals. It was the class that they called the class that the stars fell on. There were so many generals that came out of this, this cohort of, of cadets. And they did a study to try and find out what was it, what, what, what was it that caused them to have so many generals. You know, there were two five-star generals, uh, two four-star generals, seven uh, three-star generals, and then the rest were two-star generals and, and brigadiers. But you know, there were so many generals that came out of this class, and the, the psychologists and all the experts wanted to find out what was it so special about this cohort of students. You know what was, it, what was special about them? Nothing. They were in the middle of a war. And when they were in the middle of the war, they realized when you are in the middle of the war and you realize that your family is at stake and your nation is at stake, it's something on the inside rises up, something of nobility rises on the inside of you. And you say, God, make me stronger, Lord. Lord, I want to rise up. Hallelujah. And I, I want to say this, my friends. God wants to do something great in this church. Hallelujah. And out of this house, God wants to raise mighty warriors. Uh, he wants to raise men with the caliber of the King David. Hallelujah. He wants to raise the Joshua's and the David. And so, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that the Spirit of the living God will fall on this house, Lord. That the Spirit of revival uh, will come upon this house uh, and that you'll give them the whole building, Lord. At some point in their lives, Lord, this building will be consecrated for your glory. Hallelujah. I pray, Father, that they will expand. Uh, they will expand into the road. They will expand into the territory, Lord, and that you'll give them faith. Hallelujah. Shikaraba. Honda, you know, uh, pastor, uh, pastors and uh, members of this church, uh, to, today we run 20 services over the weekend. 20 services. We have, we have five services in Bible House. We have two big services in the Bugis Plus. Uh, we have seven services in the main congregation in Katong. We have services in, the, in, the, uh, in Jurong. We have services in Tuas as well. In all these uh, dormitories uh, that God has given us favor in. We have services in the uh, different uh, levels. We have services in Katong Shopping Center. We've taken another space there. I, I, we just got to think differently in this hour. We got to think expansion. Amen. We cannot we cannot defend uh, the territory. You cannot have a defensive mindset. When they train young boxers for fighting, they train them to fight and win. Hallelujah. And the only way you can win is to go on the offensive. So Lord, I pray let an anointing for battle and war be upon this church. Hallelujah. I thank you that the work that you have done in this house to prepare them for this, Lord. And so God, give them the may take arm, our Lord. Hallelujah. Give them, Lord, the, the, the places that they've been asking you for and grant to them the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Lord, I speak your blessings over this house. Shandaraba. Would you just lift up your hands, everybody, just for a few moments. I just want to speak the blessings of God over your life. And you know, I believe with all my heart that when I pray this prayer, that God will bless you. He will bless your family. He will bless your household. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have authority. You have given us the authority. You have authorized us, Lord, to speak the word with power and glory. And I pray for, for this congregation.
intercession for every family that's here today, that you would bless them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, be blessed, hallelujah. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. Let's give God a big praise.